Uh, they, um, at that table, as Hank Benner table, said, as Hank Benner said, there are approximately 15 places, that is to say 11 plus uh, some extras for uh, interested countries such as Israel, if, if it's the Israeli question, or uh, the Hungarian delegate, as in this case. And very close to that table, a distance of only 15 feet, is a bank of seats of a pea green. How about that color, Ben? Would you would that pass? A pea green color with the uh, arm uh, desks or rests like a school uh, uh, seat uh, for the press. And here sit the members of the press. They are gentlemen from all over the world. Some of them are Americans, of course. Some of them Swiss and British and whatnot. <coughs> and they can listen to the debate as long as they want. They can come freely, go freely, and uh, uh, send their reports at any time. And, of course, they listen in whatever language they wish by the device that I've been explaining uh, of uh, putting the little earphone into the ear, turning a little dial at the bottom of the seat, and catching the language as it is given. Ben, I wonder if you wouldn't cast your eyes across to the other side of the room where you see a sign that says French 3 and Russian 4 and Spanish 5 and so on, <coughs> and tell us what you think is going on there. What uh, There's a uh, quiet there, what Teddy Roosevelt called innocuous desuetude, uh, but it'll be the opposite when the Security Council is active because uh, the five working languages, official languages, I should say, of the uh, UN organizations are, as Mr. Pearson's indicated to you, English, French, Russian, Spanish, and Chinese. And whatever is said in any one of the languages during an original presentation in whatever language of, one of those f five is immediately translated, interpreted, I think is the word they use here, into the other four instantaneously. In other words, while if I were a delegate, were saying, uh, ladies and gentlemen, at that very moment in French, they'd be saying messieurs, mesdames, or whatever the equivalent is in Russian, Spanish, and Chinese. The people who do this are people of incredible reaction time from ear to tongue. That is, from the moment that the, the split second that they hear the word ladies to the time the word messieurs comes out of their mouth is uh, the fastest in, uh, on land in the world. Uh, they have an amazing vocabulary and a complete uh, uh, ambivalence as between languages. They're able to switch from one to the other in ideas as well as the physical movement of their speech apparatus so that they can pick up what Mr. Delegate is saying in language A and put it into language B with uh, the minimum of lag. Actually, the way it works out in practice, in order to be able to get the sense of a, of a sentence, it's hard to say, to know perhaps whether the word sense, as I said it in English, means S-E-N-S-E -E or C-E-N-T-S. They will wait until a whole phrase or perhaps even a sentence is concluded and then will spill it forth, having retained those 10 to 25 words in the sentence in their memory, put them into the language into which they are translating, and thus they are lagging a sentence behind. We found that by switching from the floor in whatever language to the language in Chinese or Russian or Spanish and, and French and found that they are running just about a, a sentence behind. That's mu purely a matter of uh, adaptation, but if the requirements were such, they could do it exactly or perhaps only a, a syllable behind the speaker. Uh, well, uh, we recall chatting with George Sherry, one of the leading of members of this interpreter corps, who is uh, completely fluent in French, English, and Russian, and perhaps, for all I know, other languages. So he uh, can occupy the Russian booth and listen to presentations in originally French or uh, English and translate them into Russian, and vice versa. Uh, you may recall, if you were joined our NBC radio audience last night during the uh, hours of uh, on-the-spot broadcasting of the General Assembly, that every time there was a Spanish speaker and there were some excellent speeches from the representative from Ecuador, Dr. Trujillo, you may recall, or from Colombia, uh, Dr. Urrutia, uh, these uh, speeches delivered in the resonant and rotund voices of the very masculine voices of the speaker in Spanish came forth as English in the voice of a well-modulated young lady, and that the well-modulated young <laughs> voice of a young lady, I mean, <laughs> I don't know, don't, know what, don't know what frequency she was on. Yeah. Uh, the point being that one of the interpreters being a woman and her task being to translate from Spanish to English, uh, that's what came out of the little loudspeaker system. We have it here in our booth, and when we uh, stop talking and switch you down to the floor, we immediately switch over to that system so that we can hear the uh, speech in English, no matter what the speech be in uh, what language is being used in the original presentation by the delegate. But as Leon Pearson has told you, following that original presentation, if it be in English, it must go into French. If it's French, it must go into English. And if it's in any one of the other three languages, Spanish, Russian, or Chinese, it must then go into the other two major languages, in that sense, English or French. Uh, I recall many times in the Korea debate in 1950 when there'd be a long presentation by the Russian representative Malik or by the American representative Warren Austin that the speech would go on and on and on. 
And now we're uh, here from our booth in the, uh, at the United Nations Security Council chamber. While we are waiting for action to begin, uh, we pause 10 seconds for station identification. WRCA, AM and FM, New York. Back in the UN Security Council, and uh, while we're waiting for action on the floor, here are bulletins from far-flung scenes of action with Leon Pearson. Oh. Actually, this has been a recapitulation. We have said, uh, perhaps as, as much as half an hour ago, something about the developing situation in Hungary. And um, for those who have come into this broadcast within the last half hour, it might be worthwhile to say that... Um, it seems quite obvious from the dispatches from Vienna and elsewhere that um, the developments in Hungary which have brought uh, these delegates into this, the special session of the Security Council are concerned with the return into Budapest and into Hungary as a whole of uh, Soviet troops. We have word from uh, the NBC correspondent Richie McEwen in Vienna to the effect that um, the Russians may be moving in to try to recapture Budapest. And there are further details of that, uh, which uh, we gave on the air a half an hour ago. From Washington, President Eisenhower has offered $20 million of food and other relief goods to Hungary. Now a recapitulation of uh, late developments in the Middle East. A spokesman for the Israeli government in Tel Aviv has said that Israeli has captured the entire Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza Strip, except for a few isolated communities. Britain and France, jet, uh, sorry, British and French jet bombers have relentlessly bombarded uh, Egyptian airfields and Suez and Cairo. In Cairo, the main radio transmitter has been knocked out. NBC has heard nothing for many hours. And as I mentioned uh, some uh, minutes ago, we had a conversation with our correspondent there, Wilson Hall, uh, only briefly. And when we had that conversation, he said that the bombing was getting closer and closer to the residential areas. You may recall that there was some dispute two days ago, three days ago, as to whether there was, as reported by Cairo, any British bombing of Cairo itself. At that time, the British denied it and said that they were um, operating only against military targets. Uh, today, Wilson Hall says the um, bombing is getting closer and closer to residential districts and that uh, there had been air raid alerts all day long. As a matter of fact, his broadcast was interrupted by bombing. Ben? Yes, I'm looking on the floor now for personalities familiar, and there I see, for instance, the representative of Saudi Arabia who made one of the most stinging speeches in the, uh, at times, highly acrimonious debate in the General Assembly yesterday, in which he uh, uh, referred with uh, taunting sarcasm to the activities of Israel, the uh, alleged peaceful uh, activities which were aggressive of Israel through the years. The Saudi Arabian is Sheikh... Uh, Al Kayal, if I recall his name, he has the disarming and mild manner of a, a Midwestern farmer. But uh, when he actually gets going, he was very strong in his speech. Dr. Tsang, who is the permanent representative of China to the United Nations, is here, as we said. Uh, down at the American delegation, there's such a knot of newsmen. Someone's come in, and he's covered entirely by the press, uh, obscuring our view. It must be uh, Henry Cabot Lodge. May I interrupt a moment to say that? Uh, uh, we see also at the head position the president of the Security Council for the month of November, who is Dr. Entazam. Um, Dr. what is the first name? Nazrola Nazrola Entazam of Iran. He is, of course, a very well-known figure here. He was at one time the president of the General Assembly for the whole session, I think, three years ago. Dr. Entazam is at this moment shaking hands with Dr. Beleunde of Peru, and he is about to take his position. Incidentally, I think it is uh, generally known that uh, the presiding, that is to say the uh, office of president of the Security, County, uh, Security Council, rotates from month to month. Uh, the French delegate was the president during the month of October, and now during the month of November, uh, following in alphabetical order, we come to Iran, and Dr. Antazam is presiding. That is, uh, that is Ambassador Lodge, who's just seated at the United, United States delegation. He is, uh, of course, very well known to all of the uh, United Nations uh, delegates and has held this position for uh, some three years with great distinction. 
the same position which uh, Senator Warren Austin held during the tense debates of 1950 on Korea. Over at the Cuban uh, delegation, I see now seated Dr. Uh, Carlos Blanco, Ambassador Blanco, the permanent representative of the of uh, Cuba to the United Nations. Also, the Chinese representative and the Belgian representative in their place. Here's Pearson Dixon has come in, and Arkady Sobolyev for the United Kingdom, and we'll have action on the floor. Gentlemen, in taking over the chair, I think it is my duty to pay a well-deserved tribute to Ambassador Courtney Gentil, uh, representative of France, um, for the authority, the tact, and the courtesy which he has invariably shown in presiding over the meetings of the, dif the difficult meetings of the Security Council. I regret that his state of health has not enabled him to join us today, and I'm sure that I'm interpreting the feelings of all of you in requesting uh, the distinguished representative of France to convey to him our very best wishes of recovery. Chair, it is my duty to pay a well deserved tribute. A few words from the presiding France, officer Ambassador with regard to the fact that uh, the ambassador of France, who is normally here, is not present today. That is to say, um, Bernard Cornu Jean T. I don't think this was mentioned by uh, the presiding officer, but I understand the fact is that uh, Cornu Jean T. is suffering from a recurrence of malaria, uh, which he contracted during the the last war in the course of fighting in Africa. Now we go to the floor. Rep Representative France. Mr. President. Mr. President, I wish to thank you for the words you have just spoken and addressed to Mr. Cornu Gentil. I shall convey to him your wishes for his speedy recovery and the regret which you have voiced at his absence today. Ambassador Cornu Gentil certainly greatly regrets also his inability to be present here today. He is still indisposed, though getting better, and he hopes to be able to attend meetings of the Council in the near future. Thank you for your expressions of sympathy. Thank you for the kind words you have just... This was, um, as you can uh, see, in a, a response by Ambassador Louis de, de Girango, who is the second in command of the French delegation, uh, thanking the president for his uh, uh, friendly words with regard to his chief, Ambassador Cornu Gentil. And those remarks, uh, as you heard them, were uh, interpreted by a young woman, whereas, of course, the original remarks were in French by the ambassador himself. Now, we go back to the floor. The premier point... The first item on our agenda is the adoption of the agenda in document S, Agenda 752, Revision 1. ...is the adoption of the agenda as it is contained in document S, Agenda 752, Rev. 1. Before um, passing on to the adoption of the agenda, I think it is my duty, um, gentlemen, to offer you an explanation. The l joint letter of the representatives of France, United Kingdom, and the United States, which figures in document S3623, requesting an urgent meeting of the Security Council, reached me at 1 a.m. this afternoon, 1 p.m. this afternoon, in view of the urgency of the matter. And since the Council was already seized with this issue, I had no choice but to call this, the Council into session. I regret it was materially impossible for me to consult with you, but I hope that as of now I will have ample time for such consultations, for it is my intention not to call meetings of the Council until I will have consulted all its members. The President. Uh, those were remarks of the President, um, Ambassador Entazam of Iran, he speaks always in French, though he does have a very good command of English, but for some reason he prefers French. And the voice that you heard was the voice of the interpreter uh, explaining for him, or translating his remarks in which he explained and apologized for the fact that this meeting was called without consultation. That is to say, uh, he had received the letter 
a request from the three ambassadors, Britain, France and the United States, only at one o'clock today, and uh, he says he had no choice but to call the, uh, the meeting urgently without uh, consulting as to the convenience of the members. The letter that he was referring to was a letter that we quoted earlier in this broadcast, indicating that the critical situation in Hungary was the matter which caused the three powers to ask for the meeting. Down to the floor. Any objections to the adoption of the agenda? As um, second document, S Agenda 752 Rev 1. Adoption of the agenda as it is contained in document S Agenda 752 Rev 1. The representative of the Soviet Union has the floor. The representative of the Soviet Union. We're now getting, of course, the remarks of the ambassador of the Soviet Union to the inclusion of this item in the agenda. The Soviet delegation explained why it was opposed to the consideration of this question in the Security Council. Our objections still remain in force. And I will vote today against the inclusion of this item in the agenda all the more uh, vigorously, if I can, can bearing in mind the way in which this matter was brought up in the Security Council. You have already explained yourself, Mr. President, uh, the rather hasty way in which this matter was brought up in the Security Council. There is no need for me to talk about that. ...contre l'inscription de cette question à l'ordre du jour. Et nous avons expliqué les motifs de notre objection. Ces objections demeurent. Mais j'ai une raison supplémentaire pour voter aujourd'hui contre cette inscription, étant donné les circonstances exceptionnelles dans lesquelles cette réunion a été convoquée. Vous avez expliqué ces circonstances, Monsieur le Président, et je n'ai pas à y revenir. Let's have it. That, that, that was an odd, um, an odd development, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Sobolov, the ambassador of the Soviet Union, intervened to object to the adoption of the agenda, which means to say to object to the consideration of the Hungarian question, just as he did when the Security Council met before on the same question. But uh, during the course of it, I didn't quite catch why, and I'm going to ask Ben. He broke into French from his uh, uh, normal speaking in Russian. Ben, did you catch it? Uh, I think what happened, we were having a little crossed wires in the Tower of Babel. He was speaking in Russian because his oh. opening words were in Russian, and we got the French I instantaneous interpretation instead of the English. Then we had both of them out, out loud. Now here's the uh, let's chairman. Go to the, the members of the council has objected to the adoption of the agenda. I have to put it to the vote. I will therefore put the adoption of the agenda to the vote. And I request those in favor to kindly raise their hand. Since one, since one member of the council has... Objected. This, of course, is a routine matter. We are getting the translation of the request or the statement by the president that since there has been an objection to the adoption of the agenda, he will ask for a vote. And here it goes. Take it. Uh, those in favor have been asked for, and all hands seem to be raised, except that of the Soviet Union. Uh, the president is about to announce the result of the vote. He says the ag agenda has been adopted. With, apparently there was only the one vote against. The Yugoslav vote for. Even uh, the delegate of Yugoslavia voted in favor, that is to say, in the same position with Britain, France, and the United States. I would invite the representative of Hungary to take his seat at the table of the council. The representative of Hungary with the decision taken by the Security Council at its 746th meeting, I now invite the representative of Hungary. Uh, the President has just announced that uh, he would invite the representative of Hungary. This, of course, is a matter of routine. Whenever there is an interested member who is not a member of the Security Council but is a member of the United Nations, he is invited to take a place at the table. His rights are not so full or complete as those of members of the Security Council. Mr. President, have you any assurance? These remarks are heard from Ambassador Tsiang of China. The government of uh, uh, the Hungarian Republic. Please uh, give us any assurance in regard to the representative character. Uh, apparently the point of the uh, ambassador of China is that um, things have been changing so rapidly in Hungary that uh, it is questionable whether the representative who has just been seated is actually a representative of the present Hungarian government. And the Chinese ambassador has asked if he could give any assurances in this regard. I would like to hear the views of the other members of the council. And I think that pending a contrary opinion, we 
supposed to accept the representative of a country so long as his status has not been disapproved by other members of the council. The views of other members of the council, but I suppose that until proof of the contrary, we have to accept the representative of a country until he has been disavowed by his government. Does anybody wish to speak on the subject? The President of the United States. I would like to ask that the, uh, the credentials... This, of course, is the voice of Ambassador Lodge of the United States. ...the Hungarian seat be submitted to the Council so we can see uh, whether he uh, does, in fact, represent the Hungarian government. Apparently, uh, Mr. Lodge is taking a comparable position to that of the Ambassador of China because he has asked that... Uh, the Hungarian delegate should present his credentials. This is now being translated. The President of Peru. Peru. Señor Presidente. Mr. President. Uh, you caught the first phrase in which uh, Dr. Belaunde of Peru began to speak in Spanish, and now you're catching the translation into English. It may be, sir, that we could have a report of the Secretariat on this question, says the representative of Peru. <laughs> that <laughs> the remarks of the ambassador of Peru were so brief that you hardly caught them. Apparently, he was asking for the uh, secretariat to give what information they have. And to the secretary general, who must study the validity of these credentials. It's going to put before the council, since under the rules of procedure, credentials must be submitted to the secretary general, and it is the secretary general who studies the question of their validity. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, to recapitulate a little here, it seems that, uh, uh, as you have heard, the question of um, the proper credentials of the Hungarian delegate has arisen, and there's a little huddle taking place at the head table. Uh, ben, take the, fo take the mic. We've just established the identity of the gentleman. He is uh, the regularly inscribed member before the disturbances of the last ten days. He is fourth in the list of the Hungarian representatives in the printed order. His name is Dr. Janos Szabo. He is the second secretary of the Hungarian delegation or mission to the United Nations. Dr. Kosh is no longer here, and uh, the other members we are not able to be sure of. Uh, but his name was, uh, he was accredited, that is, two weeks ago. Whether there have been profound changes in the Hungarian mission here in New York which would make him not acceptable to the present Hungary, uh, government in Hungary is what's being discussed. Not received yet uh, officially in the secretariat any uh, particular uh, information or uh, any credentials uh, uh, from the Hungarian government itself. Uh, the voice you just heard was the, the voice of the secretary uh, of the Security Council, who is a permanent member of the secretariat and who was, uh, as I gather, indicating that they did not have full information about credentials. Uh, Monsieur Sobol m'a également fait savoir qu'il était autorisé par son gouvernement d'agir à la place de uh, that, that was the French translation of the language of the Secretary of the Security Council. I noticed, by the way, that the U.S. delegate, Mr. Large, is asking to speak, and he will now take the floor. The Secretary has something to add to his first statement. Has something to add to his first statement. Uh, no, Mr. Large is not yet speaking. We'll go back to the Secretary of the Security Council. That, uh, a cable has been received from the Hungarian government appointing Dr. Janos Szabo at the emergency ses session of the General Assembly yesterday. Before recognizing, sir, I would like uh, the cable to be read. Speaker, I would ask that the cable which we have just received be read out to the council. Uh, of course, Mr. President, this cable uh, has bearing on the uh, emergency session of the General Assembly, but the cable is uh, fallen content. Uh, His Excellency Doug Hamasho, Secretary General, United Nations, I have the honor to inform you that Mr. Janos Szabo, first secretary of the permanent mission, will represent the Hungarian People's Republic at the special session of the General Assembly at the United Nations to be convened on November 1st, 1956 at New York, uh, signed by the Prime, Prime Minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs.
Euh, évidemment, ce télégramme euh, concerne la session extraordinaire de l'Assemblée. En voici le texte. À son Excellence, M. Hammerschold, secrétaire général. J'ai l'honneur de vous faire savoir que M. Yann Sabot, premier secrétaire de la représentation hongroise, a été désigné pour représenter la Hongrie à la session extraordinaire qui doit se réunir le 1er novembre à New York. Signé euh, Premier ministre, ministre des Affaires étrangères de la République populaire de Hongrie. La parole est à M. le Président. The distinguished President of the United States. Uh, Mr. President, I, I would like to read uh, Rule 14 and Rule 15 and then uh, propound a, a question. Uh, Rule 14 says, any member of the United Nations not a member of the Security Council and any state not a member of the United Nations, if invited to participate in a meeting or meetings of the Security Council, shall submit credentials for the representative appointed by it for this purpose. The credentials of such a representative shall be communicated to the Secretary General not less than 24 hours before the first meeting which he is invited to attend. That's Rule 14. And now Rule 15 says, the credentials of representatives on the Security Council and of any representative appointed in accordance with Rule 14 shall be examined by the Secretary General who shall submit a report to the Security Council for approval And now, Mr. President, in the light of those two rules, I just raise the question whether this gentleman here on my, on my left uh, is qualified to sit at this session for this purpose. Le représentant des États-Unis, Monsieur le Président, je voudrais vous reporter aux articles 13, 14 et 15. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the situation that prevails here at the Security Council is one of no very grave importance for the uh, progress of the meeting, save Uh, the, uh, that it concerns the participation of the delegate of Hungary. Uh, he is not, of course, a member of the Security Council, but he has been invited to take his seat and has taken his seat, uh, whereupon uh, his credentials were challenged, first by the delegate of China and then by the delegate of the United States, and this matter is being discussed. Uh, obviously, in the background, there lies the fact that there has been very considerable political turnover in Hungary in the last uh, 10 days, and uh, apparently some of the delegates feel that this gentleman may not actually be the representative of the present uh, uh, regime in Hungary, but may be a holdover from the pro-Stalin or pro-Moscow regime of a week or two ago. I was informed of the contents of these two articles, but you must admit that when the council itself was called within a period of three hours, it is very difficult for the to ask a representative country to submit its credentials 24 hours in advance. It is for this reason that it was materially impossible for the Secretariat to fulfill the requirements of these two rules. I have a suggestion now. I do not know what the feeling of the Council will be about it. In my belief, since the rules allow us to accept provisionally the credentials of a representative of a country before having had time to examine these credentials, I would suggest that the representative of Hungary retain his seat at the council table, but that they should not make a statement so that the secretariat may be in a position to verify these credentials. Do you agree? The president, before calling on the representative of the United Kingdom, I would like to ans answer Mr. Lodge's objections. I was aware of the two rules to which he referred, but I think you must admit that when the council itself is called only on three hours' notice, it's difficult to ask a representative to submit his credentials 24 hours in advance. Uh, take a vote while you're talking, I'll tell. We are now having the second translation of the remarks of um, Ambassador Entazam of Iran, who is the president of the Security Council for the month of November. As we said a moment ago, this is a procedural question to examine whether or not the uh, Hungarian delegate has the right to join them at the table, or rather, does he represent the government which is now in power in Budapest? Um, the Security Council summoned to meet at 5 o'clock uh, did not meet actually until about 5.40, and thus far has uh, only succeeded in adopting the agenda, uh, that is to say, that in deciding that they will deal with the Hungarian question of this over the objections of the Soviet delegate. So Pearson Dixon is now uh, taking the floor to speak, uh, but um, uh, we shall leave for the time being uh, 
uh, this discussion in the Security Council, and uh, here is Ben Grower. We pause for station identification. Thank you.